All right, hello everybody and welcome to this Open Access Australasia uh, webinar uh, number four of the year. We're, we're delighted to have you with us. Um, we're just going to start the recording um, just as we uh, go and we'll, um, we'll get underway in just a moment. So uh, just a quick thing for practicalities, if you could uh, do the usual of keep yourself muted, um, keep your, uh, your video off just for bandwidth, and we will post the slides and the recording afterwards. So my name is Ginny Barber, I'm the Director of Open Access Australasia. Um, I'm just doing the logistics today. Um, just a quick thing about Open Access Australasia, if you're not familiar with us, we're an organisation that's across Australia and New Zealand, out here in New Zealand. We're delighted to have uh, 28 universities and five affiliate organisations. Um, I've put up here our fabulous executive committee and just the principles that support us, which I think are some of them are particularly relevant to the webinar today. Um, so with that, I will pass over to Kim Terry, who's the chair of our executive committee, to welcome you and to kick off the webinar. Uh, tina koto, tina koto, tina koto katoa. Uh, ko Kim Tairi toku ingoa, uh, no Waikato oku uh, tupuna, uh, kiti nohu au ki owai raka inaine. No reira, tina koto, tina koto, tina tato katoa. Uh, kia ora, hello everybody. Uh, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and future and their enduring connection to place, land and sea that was never ceded. I invite you to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners and custodians of the land where you stand today uh, in the chat. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome our speakers today, uh, Libby Hepburn and Associate Professor Alice Motion, who will be talking to us about citizen science. And uh, you would have seen their bios up on the website, but just a, a quick reminder, uh, Libby is the founder and continuing advocate for Australian uh, citizen science, who are our newest affiliate member. Uh, which we're so pleased about. Uh, and we just got that fantastic news today. And uh, she is also the uh, uh, Citizen uh, Science Global Partnership. Uh, and she is the Vice Chair of Citizen Science and Open Science Community uh, of Practice. And then uh, Professor, Associate Professor Alice Motion is the Westpac Research Fellow uh, at the School of uh, Chemistry at the University of Sydney, where she leads the Science Communication Outreach Participation and Education Research Group, finding ways to connect people with science and to make research much more accessible. So you're going to hear from both uh, Libby and Alice, and they're going to uh, co-present and switch between uh, each other. So it will be a very enjoyable uh, presentation, and I don't want to take up any more of your time uh, because you want to hear from them. Uh, Na mihi nui kia koto. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the session. Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Libby Hepburn and Alice is here with me and we're delighted and thank you very much for inviting us here. And um, I'm speaking from the far south coast of New South Wales on the land of the Nguyen Nation and I would like to pay my respects to um, elders past, present and emerging and indeed all indigenous people who are, have been the custodians of our land for such a long time. Alice, do you want to say hello before we yes, get going? I will do, yes, thanks very much Libby. And thank you Ginny and Kim um, for the invitation and kind introduction. I'm joining from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and I also acknowledge um, them as the traditional owners of the land on which um, I'm joining you from and it's great to see those acknowledgements of country um, popping up in the chat. It's lovely to be with you. Thank you. So 
Um, we're going to do a bit of a tag team, and I'm not quite sure how this is going to work because we haven't agreed who's doing it. But at the moment, I've got the <laughs> I've got the, the helm. So um, I want to say thank you for inviting us, and also very much thank you for inviting us to become um, affiliates of Open Access Australasia. We think this is a very important invitation, and look forward to working with you, particularly on on open science, which we think is the biggest opportunity in a generation to help create a new landscape in science, which includes and benefits so many, including science itself. Um, we thought you might be interested just as a quick um, introduction to see how we've come to open science. So um, for myself, when I retired at 47, um, I've spent the last 20 years being involved in, in citizen science. Um, and in the last uh, 11 years now, I've been um, running a project with our community down in the far south coast of New South Wales, which is a biodiversity monitoring project. And we've done great things. We've um, now got, as you can see here, we've got uh, over 1,300 observers, contributors to what we're doing, nearly 60,000 observations. And we've done all kinds of things in 10 years, run lots of bio blitzes, um, um, lots of field days. We've invited lots of uh, experts and, and our own experts to work with our community. And the whole purpose of this is because it's, we believe that it's really important to get everyone in the community in nature, um, enjoying it, uh, learning about it, recording, and knowing more about it so that we too can become custodians of our land. So that's my local experience. Um, but also in, in the, at the same time, I've been involved in, in helping to develop the the infrastructure of, of citizen science. And that was firstly with the Australian Citizen Science Association that we set up. Um, and the, because there was a need, there was so much citizen science going on and people wanted a community, wanted a, a vehicle to talk to each other. Um, and through that, I've got involved more with um, some of the things that are happening globally, first of all, with the European Citizen Science Association, but I've been fortunate enough to go to a number of the, the big global uh, events which where, where we think citizen science has a place. You know, the World Data Forum, um, the Science Policy Business Forum, and several of the UNEAs. And, um, in, in the last few years, we've been invited by the United Nations, by UNEP, by UNESCO, um, encouraging us to come together and to form um, a, a global partnership so that they, they, can, they and other agencies can talk to, to people. So I've come to open science through these experiences and seeing what's happening around the kind of the work that we do. So it's from um, a project management point of view and also as an advocate for citizen science. Very different from Alice's experience. Yeah, so mine's, thanks Libby, mine's sort of um, almost exactly the opposite in a way. So I've come to citizen science through open science. So um, almost exactly 10 years ago, I moved to Australia from the UK. I'm, I'm a chemist, trained as a chemist. Um, and I came to work with Professor Matthew Todd who'd founded the Open Source Malaria Consortium um, that was originally started at Sydney University. And now um, it's, you know, it's an international community and, and Matt is now professor at UCL in London. Um, and I came to, to come and be um, a chemist um, as part of this project. And really uh, what, you know, what drew me to this project was that we had the excitement of trying to find a new medicine for malaria. Um, but the methodology in which we were, were, we were going to follow, as well as um, being medicinal chemists, we, we were going to have all of our data completely open and remove patents from the process and have online um, electronic notebooks that could be accessed by anyone. Um, and quite, um, quite early in this journey, one of the things that I realised was that 
because of the lack of patterns and the lack of secrecy, there was an opportunity to get people involved in this research who aren't ordinarily involved in drug discovery research. And as a student, um, I actually worked for a pharmaceutical company for a year while doing my undergrad. And when I came back to present my work to my colleagues, because of um, some of the secrecy about those structures, I, I couldn't really share the chemistry that I'd, I'd done to the full extent. And so something I remembered from my undergrad and thought it'd be great if we could try and recreate this experience, um, but in a way that we could share this with, with young people. And Libby, if you could change the slide, that would be great. Um, and so the project that emerged from this is the Breaking Good project. So we started with working with undergraduate students at the University of Sydney and, and in some other locations around the world, who rather than doing um, traditionally a little bit more recipe style chemistry um, laboratory classes, they had the opportunity to, to make potential new anti-malarial candidates as part of their um, as part of their chemistry training. And this um, later developed into the Breaking Good project, um, which has expanded to work with high school students to either make potential new medicines for diseases with low market incentives, or in, in this case, in 2016, we had a bit of um, press coverage because we recreated the price hiked medicine Daraprin um, with a group of high school students. Um, and for me, it's very important to talk about with young people, I love chemistry, uh, young people and members of the community about not just the science and the chemistry, but the potential um, the potential for uh, benefiting society, but also uh, some of the reasons why medicines aren't accessible uh, for certain folks in, in certain communities. And so we have some really interesting conversations with students. We go to the next slide, Libby. Um, I've also been writing now for a few years or two and a half years or so um, for Chemistry World magazine in a column called Citizen Chem, which uh, I focus on a lot of citizen science projects or and I sort of expand a little bit beyond chemistry too, um, but also celebrating any ways in which um, we can involve the public in research through outreach or participation. Um, and so, um, yes, in contrast to Libby, I've sort of come to citizen science through open science. Okay, so we'll go on to the, I think the, the main focus of, of what we're trying to do today is the have a look at the where citizen science sits um, with the UNESCO recommendation on open science. And the citizen science community was invited by UNESCO to get involved in this as it was being developed. Um, and when we saw what they were trying to do, um, we were all extremely excited by it because we see it, as I said, as the, probably the, the greatest point of leverage for citizen science to become mainstream science uh, it, that we'll see in a generation. Um, and if you look at the, the, the main areas, the, the things that, that uh, the recommendation is trying to do, it's, it's actually trying to, um, to make the big changes. It's, tr it's trying to actually help the world to engineer a paradigm shift in science and opening science to society. So it des describes the, um, this is really important to us. This is kind of the, the background stuff for the recommendation, but it, it really, it talks about an evolution or a revolution in science. Um, and it's for the purposes of enabling both science and society to contribute much more powerfully together to solving the challenges that face the world in, in the future. And as we all know, we're coming up against some pretty tough ones. And all the elements which have, have been identified as integral to that aim need to be included and in, incorporated in the implementation of the recommendation. So one of the, the phrases that we think is very important in, in this is the, the um, the recognition by UNESCO that opening access to data, publications and other research products is necessary but not sufficient to transition science fully towards open science. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, I don't... 
My computer is being difficult. <laughs> I don't understand this. Libby, we can see the next slide, which is the implementation one. Do you, are you? Can we could um, could maybe Alice could you do a screen share because my screen's frozen. Ah, it it's seems gone to be now. now Libby. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so it, the, I'm assuming that, that, that um, everybody that's here will, uh, will know a little bit about the uh, open science recommendation. And if we look at half of the, the recommendations, key elements, we'll see that, that, that they're all to do with the space that citizen science works in. Um, so that's at least half of, of, of what's there. And this is an important element to us as well, that, that um, the recommendation is opening the processes of scientific knowledge creation, evaluation and communication to societal actors beyond the traditional scientific community. And that is what citizen science is all about. So um, as we understand it, then citizen science has a huge amount of value to add to the recommendation. And this is what we're, we're seeking to do. And one of the things we think is wonderful about, about it is that it's actually encouraging people um, to increase scientific collaborations and sharing of information. And that's how we see our relationship with um, Open Access Australasia because we think there are lots of opportunities there for us to do just that. And I'll, I'll ask Alice to take on uh, the next few slides because um, uh, she'll talk about... Uh, Thanks, this, Libby. This element of it, sorry. Thanks, Libby. So this is, um, this is an image that Libby and I are both um, big fans of um, by Lotta Thomason. And um, the, the idea of this umbrella of open science as including different aspects, including open data, open access and citizen science, and the interplay between the importance of each of those aspects. So um, I think sometimes, and I, I know that this is a topic familiar to this group, but um, some people have quite different ideas in the broader community about what open means about what open science is what about what about what what open access is what open data is and sometimes those terms can be used interchangeably um and perhaps not always in the way that um they might be more broadly defined by specific interest groups but the way that open data open access and citizen science are connected here um, I think really emphasizes the importance of each of those aspects, the importance of, for example, public engagement and involvement and co-creation, and how if that is integrated with best practice in open data and open access, there's a real chance to, as Libby has already sort of suggested, and this is and this is written in this recommendation, to achieve open science that really does start to shift the culture of who does science, who is a scientist, who can create um, new information or new knowledge. Um, and so this is, a, this is an image that we, we come back to a lot when we're considering the interplay between these three areas. If I could have the next slide, please. So we're just going to give you um, a, a small snapshot of the breadth and scale of citizen science globally. And um, we, we, we could barely do justice to this um, in, in the time we have, there are so many fantastic projects, but we thought we'd, first of all, um, just uh, introduce um, some of the ways that different types of participation have been described in both uh, public participation in science, scientific research or PPSR by Bonnie et al. Um, in 2009. This, um, this diagram on the left sort of suggests the different ways that that people can contribute to, to scientific research. And that kind of contribution can be contributory where you're um, giving data towards a project and move to collaboration and then ultimately to co-creative projects, which have a lot of strength in, in creating them with the community, um, with different actors being part of the design of those projects. And um, Hackley has, has also written um, a lot about this, Mookie Hackley, um, 
And one of the, the, the typologies that he presented in 2013 in a fantastic book chapter was presenting levels of, 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 of participation in, in citizen science where we can move um, from levels which have lower cognitive in input, where we're crowdsourcing, perhaps this could be volunteered computing, for example, moving to what um, Muki refers to as extreme citizen science, uh, where um, all actors are involved in, in the design and creation of, of those projects. And um, if we go to the next slide, Olivia, um, Muki Hackley is also in his fantastic blog and in subsequent academic pieces, um, written about um, different levels of engagement in citizen science and sort of visualized this in a form of an escalator. Um, and I think what's so good about this, if we imagine this escalator as one that can magically move up and down, um, depending on, um, on, on where you're sitting on there, that people can have different, um, different levels of engagement. And some people might move from um, the bottom of the escalator up and throughout their um, throughout their lives or throughout their careers. And other people might move between different um, levels of engagement depending on um, what's happening in their lives at any, at, at any one time. Um, and I think it's to be celebrated that there are different ways and different levels of engagement, which is another way of making citizen science more inclusive and trying to enable participation to happen at different levels of engagement. Next slide, please, Libby. So um, before I hand back to Libby, I'm just going to introduce some of you, I'd love to see um, maybe with a, a show of digital hands, um, if any of you or your families or friends are involved in any citizen science projects, do we have any citizen scientists on the call or who are involved in running projects in any way? Got a few thumbs up, that's great to see. Um, we'd love to love to hear which projects um, you're involved in. You can put that in the chat or as part of the discussion later. So um, one of the uh, one of one of the strengths in, in different types of engagement and different ways to participate is that many projects are hosted online and enable people to participate from wherever they are, um, with the requirement, of course, for having. Uh, an internet connection and access to websites or to mobile phone applications. And uh, one of the most, well, I think it's actually the most popular uh, platform for people powered science. I think that's the tagline or one of the taglines for Zooniverse. There's over a million people contributing to scientific research projects online through this project that have, have diff many different forms. And we just highlighted one here um, that's uh, an Australian-based um, project that uh, had a great app, the Fireballs in the Sky project, where people are invited to, using their app, follow um, fireballs across the sky and to, to map the, the movement of, of meteorites or other fiery bodies and to even add um, colour um, and shape and size and to, to look at the trajectory and to report those to um, a, a kind of the, the central project. Uh, for the Desert Fireball Network, who are really trying to understand um, how the solar system formed by looking at these, these, uh, these bodies. And there are citizen science projects that span a wide range of disciplines. Um, as a chemist, um, it's really great to, to be able to share a little bit of the Folded project because um, many citizen science projects are based in biodiversity and ecology, which is couldn't be more important, but it's lovely to see that there are a diversity of different types of scientific projects that people can get engaged with. Fold, it is um, an online um, computer game where people are tasked with trying to fold, uh, fold proteins and to try and understand protein structure, which is still um, a, a challenging uh, thing to do, um, although AI methods are, are fast approaching uh, or have been developed a, and are emerging in this space. And you can learn how to play this game and fold proteins online. And in fact, some of the uh, the research that's been done by Citizen Science has been um, included in, in in major publications. It's in some of the highest. Um, uh, I, I'll go with highest impact factor journal, impact factor journals um, in this instance as, as explaining that. But they they've um, published work that has been um, quite extraordinary on both de novo proteins and. Um, 
um, and existing proteins. And it's it's been a great project to follow. Actually, during um, the pandemic, when we weren't able to get our students to come into the laboratories at university, we um, developed some labs based on using Foldit to try and teach the students some biochemistry. Um, and they were involved in a Foldit project trying to design possible um, possible binders for the coronavirus spike protein. So um, it was fantastic to see during um, the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic, how many citizen science approaches there, there were um, or projects that people could become involved in. Um, and this is just a screen grab of an article that um, I was one of the co-authors on um, from colleagues at the University of Sydney and um, colleagues from the Australian Citizen Science Association looking at some of these projects of how people could contribute to coronavirus research whilst um, living through lockdowns. So the examples I've shared are projects that um, are largely web-based and um, are, can be can, you can contribute to um, no matter where you are. And I'm going to now hand to Libby to talk about um, one of her particular passions, which is citizen science projects that are place-based. Thanks very much. Now, to me, um, the power of citizen science is when people are invested in the projects that they're involved with. And the sweet spot is where it's important to science and it's also important to people. And I'm a, I'm a great um, advocate of place-based science because I think you can get amazing results and you can get long-term uh, engagement by, by community if the, the project is important. And this is one of my very favorites and, and there are, I'd love to spend an hour talking about this one, but this is a project set up in Flanders and um, they expected about maybe 2000 people to get involved with it. Um, over Flanders, um, they had a, a government had 160 air quality monitoring stations, and there was there was a lot of um, problems because people didn't think that 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 was they were getting good enough results. So they set up this project where people stuck a little um, monitor on the outside of their houses, and they eventually got 20,000 people. And over the years, they've had probably 5,000, sorry, 5% 5 of the population of Flanders being involved in this. And they've got much more important data because it's, it's much more detail. So I, can't, I don't have time to go into any more of it here, but there's a lot of information about it. And this is another one. This is the Amazon Basin going through a completely different scale. Um, the Amazon goes through five different countries and it's vast. And there's a project there that's been going for 20 years. And there are over a hundred different uh, citizen science groups all along this river that are, are taking um, measurements of fish migrations and water quality because it's very important to them. Um, it's a brilliant project. Um, and it also illustrates something that, that we think many people may not know about, which is why that the sophistication of the, the way that this science is undertaken is, is very impressive because you've got these fishermen and um, they're being asked to give all kinds of data, um, which is important to their livelihoods and it may influence competition in terms of what they're trying to do. So there's this um, really interesting group that talks about open collaborative science in, in development. And they've developed these ideas about situated openness. So data is as open as it can be, but it it's, um, gives privacy when necessary and it can be a complex project. So that to me is a really, a, a really good example of what citizen science can do. And this is another favorite of mine. This is the Pacific community, small island states. Um, and they're doing lots of different sorts of citizen science. And they're actually using the citizen science, the results of this to help to develop uh, management actions for their environment. And they're on the front line of a lot of things and they don't have many resources. So the fact that they're using citizen science because it's valuable, it's important, it gives them information that they need. I think is a great recommendation. 
Um, so over the years, what we've seen is, is that different groups of people are getting together in different areas and different citizen science associations have now developed. Um, and as I say, what has happened over the, maybe three years ago, the United Nations came and asked, uh, asked us if we would consider getting together as a global organization that they could work with. So we're very pleased to announce that we're actually going to be legally um, formalized um, and hopefully ready for the EXA conference, which is in October. And the global partnership is there. It's a network of networks. Um, not just through the citizen science associations, but through different kinds of work, like uh, work on global mosquitoes, like the work we're doing on open science. Um, and it's there to coordinate actions, but to inform global policies and establish global communities of practice. And the principles and values and aims that we have are so close to those of open science. Uh, we're in absolute alignment with, with what open science is trying to do. So if we go back to this, um, the recommendation is talking about uh, um, making scientific processes more transparent, inclusive and democratic. And that, of course, is what citizen science is about. And it's also, um, we're hoping it's going to be a game changer to bridge the science, technology and innovation gaps. And also between and within countries, and also, this is an important one, fulfilling the human right to science. Not easy things to aim for. This idea of, of um, equality and equity, um, trying to do something as we move in the direction of open science to actually even up the playing field. So that's what we're working, working towards. And so we, we come to look at citizen science in policy. And this is one of the key um, UNESCO recommendation areas of action is developing an enabling policy environment for citizen science and enhancing the inclusion of citizen and part participatory science as integral parts of open science policies and practices at na national, institutional and funder levels. So that's what they're looking for. And yet when we look to, I was just looking to try and find you really good examples of where we can see policy for citizen science actually embedded. And interestingly enough, the United States is one of the places where it first happened. In the Obama administration, um, they got every single, federal government agency to put in KPIs as to how they were working with the community and they had to report against the, the work they were doing uh, in partnership with the community. Um, obviously there was a bit of a, a hiatus in the last few years, but recently um, since Biden's become president, we've got to a point where things are happening again. And these are some of the big organizations um, NOAA, which is the National Oceans Agency in the US, and NASA, you will know of, they both have um, citizen science strategies which are embedded, and they see this as a really powerful way of achieving the objectives of the organizations. So we have references there. But if you want to see where it's really happening, you need to go to Europe. And uh, um, there's a, a really interesting multi-annual plan here from the Netherlands, um, where this is exactly what they're trying to do. Um, and also in the, in the European Commission, um, you can see they have uh, citizen science in policy and practice. So there are good examples of how it can be done. And this is what UNESCO is, is hoping from the citizen science community that we can actually help um, to identify how countries, 193 countries that signed up to it, can uh, start down the road or, or extend the work that they're doing. But I also want to say that, again, ref referring back, that it's not just the rich countries, not just the developed countries that can do this. If you actually look at some of the least resourced and, and some of the developing countries, you can see that they're 
probably further down the road than countries like Australia, for instance, in terms of um, approaching open science and integrating open science in what they're doing. Um, these are some examples from uh, Africa and also going back to our Pacific communities again. And we need to look at that and we can learn from them too. And in Australia, what we did when we identified what the opportunities were for citizen science in the open science recommendation. Um, last year, we held three workshops, one at the ANU, one at Sydney and, and one at the AXA conference. And we looked at these areas of action to, to see if we could agree um, what we might do to, to be able to contribute in citizen science to these UNESCO areas of action. And there were, we've got some really good uh, ideas and, and things that we're understanding, but the key recommendation, the key understanding that we got was that we need a seat at the table. At the moment, citizen science is really peripheral. It's not got any infrastructure in terms of the, the policy of the country and, and it's not got, it's got very little funding as well. So we see getting a seat at the table where policies are discussed when, we, when countries are starting to develop their response to the recommendation, that's a really important thing. So I'll hand back over to Alice now to uh, talk about her thoughts on this element. So this is, uh, thanks Libby, this is a, a rather crude cartoon and uh, Libby had linked to the Voland and Gogol paper earlier in, in the talk, which we can share a link to too. But really, I, I think as, as somebody who um, works in both open science and citizen science and believes in both of them but also recognizes the many challenges in working in these in these areas and and the fun and games of some of those challenges too i think it, it's it's really clear that open science um and citizen science sh should be um linked very strongly and we think back to that umbrella that citizen science is a key part of open science if we if we want to change scientific culture and democratize science so that um, people can participate in, in research and be more informed about making or empowered to make decisions um, that will impact their lives positively, um, these two things should be going hand in hand. And there is an awful lot for citizen science um, to learn from open science. Um, sometimes there are lots of principles that are followed, but there are challenges when you're trying to create a project and trying to make sure all of your data is open and accessible. Um, many times there aren't enough resources uh, to do this or, or, or knowledge to have to do this properly. And so I think the citizen science community has uh, uh, still has a lot to learn from open science and open science too can learn a lot from the citizen science community. So it's uh, really exciting for us both to be part of this um, seminar and to be speaking with all of you, but also as Libby had mentioned at, at the top to be part of become as AXA part of Open, open Access Australasia. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. I just wanted to pop um, one slide in too, that because I think this is a project that um, we have funded at the University of Sydney, the Learning by Doing project. It's funded by the New South Wales Department of Education. And we're trying to, um, we're, well, we're doing a research project where we're trying to um, embed citizen science learning programs in primary and secondary schools uh, and in the state um, with the hypothesis that this participation in science um, and the learning by doing might help them to enjoy science more at school, um, might help them to learn uh, more science in school and really to um, have an opportunity to be to be part of science rather than learning about um, science from textbooks or, um, or other ways. And I think this sort of links into the policy piece too, that if we um, can involve people from a young age in citizen science and teach them about open science, this could go a long way to changing the way that we as a society think about science and its place um, as, at the, as it should be, in my opinion at least, um, it should be you know, at the heart of our shared culture and the way we think about uh, solving problems together as a community. Next slide, please. Oh, and I should mention too, Libby said it was okay to do a shout out. We actually have a postdoctoral position on this project um, that is currently open, should any of you be interested or know anyone who might be. And there will be also a, um, 
uh, a PhD scholarship opening a little bit later this year too. Um, my screen's gone wonky again, I'm really sorry. That's okay. If you Can you click on the Google Doc onto the slide? I think that will work. I think you're back there, Libby. Do you what, sorry? You're, I think you're back. If you click forward now, it's working. Hey. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, coming back really to this, this document and um, well, there's some, some screenshots from this document that Libby had shared earlier, we really strongly believe that um, open science and, and open science is so important and that citizen science should be a part of this. And we also acknowledge that there are many librarians who are part of this call and um, some of the fantastic work that's been done in creating community and building community groups outside and um, around uh, library communities. We think there's a very strong part to play here with citizen science and open science and room to, to expand on those collaborations um, in the future too. Excellent, please. Um, and so Libby, I'm, I might hand to you to wrap up, but I'll just say um, thank you from my perspective for the opportunity to, to join you today. We're really looking forward to discussing with you um, and we'd love to hear from you. Um, if you would like to find out more about what we're up to um, or if you'd like to join the community of practice for citizen science and open science, um, I know that um, Libby has been leading together with colleagues in Europe much of the work in this space and I've been trying to help um, where I can with the Australian um, development um, of some of these ideas too. And there will also, and Libby, maybe you could speak to this, be some opportunities for, for folks to contribute um, to some of the work that's um, been set up because of these collaborations that, that have been developed. And perhaps I'll pass to you there to, to let people know a little bit more about that. Okay, thank you very much everybody for listening to us for this length of time. Um, yes, I would just say that in the last week or so, UNESCO has um, has asked us to, to, to do more to develop a, um, guidelines for how the how of, of doing citizen science and in integrating citizen science into open science and open science policy. And there's now, um, I think at least two universities that are, uh, we're talking to about um, maybe for, and UNESCO finding um, interns or graduate postgraduates or undergraduates to work on pulling together some of these amazing resources in, in citizen science and, and developing a framework that we can take back to UNESCO for launch at the global, can't remember the name of the thing, but it's a, a global meeting that, that UNESCO is going to talk about the implementation of the recommendation in December. So if anybody's interested in that, then please let us know. And otherwise, um, thank you very much, Kim, Ginny, everybody at the uh, Open Access Australasia for inviting us. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Libby and Alice. That was absolutely amazing. And um, I'm just loving the discussions that are going on in Twitter at the moment. There's lots of enthusiasm, <laughs> exclamation marks and, and kind of excitement about what you described. So thank you so much for that. Um, I also, I just think one of the themes of democratization of science and um, uh, increasing the involvement of, of, of society in science is, is clearly something that really resonates with this, this audience. So that's, um, thank you very much for that. And just thank you again for all your advocacy on this topic. I, um, you know, we know how hard advocacy is and uh, it's just fantastic to see that this is now coming to fruition. And I think it's incredibly important that it's now gonna be part of, you know, properly considered the UNESCO Open Science Recommendation. So there's a couple of um, questions people have popped into the chat. I'm just going to read them out. And then if you want to, if anyone else has got any more, please do that. The first one I just think is, is a comment, but it's a question that I think might be interested, interesting in just your views on about the concept. Um, for, this is from Janet. The concept of place-based um, citizen science seems a very an excellent chance to reach out to indigenous and traditional knowledge uh, to increase that science and participation from that area. And is that something you could comment on particularly? Because I know that there's a, a real feeling that we want to make sure that we are it, pr properly including Indigenous perspectives in the open science agenda going forward. Alice, do you want to talk to that one? I'm sure. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's a really great question. I think um, if we think about 
some of those sort of um, hierarchies of types of participation too. Um, any projects in that space um, should always be co-created and, and, and community led or, you know, about um, exploring questions that are important to particular communities. So I think there's um, a real potential there and particularly that citizen science and in fact, all areas of research have a lot to learn about indigenous research methods. Um, certainly something that I am learning a lot about um, through, you know, working, reading the work of some great scholars in that, those areas. But yes, I think that's uh, certainly a, a, a very important avenue for development. And I did mention a couple of examples where um, Indigenous people, local people are already doing amazing work in terms of their, their own environments and, and where they are. I think globally there's an awful lot happening. Um, certainly in Australia, there's more and more happening with Indigenous people, but I don't know, I don't know quite how well that's being publicised. Um, I Maybe we could do more mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. I think just to jump off a, a point there, if that's okay, Libby, I think one of the things that um, Libby introduced this term of situated openness to me, I hadn't heard of that framing. And I think um, perhaps some of those projects could be more widely publicized, perhaps, but perhaps some of them too have this aspect of situated openness and um, which data should be shared to whom, when, why, and how it will be used. And uh, particularly, well, with, with all communities, but I think particularly uh, in Australia, if we're thinking about uh, research that's um, co-created with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, thinking about situated openness and making sure that the communities have the decision, uh, or, you know, the, the, the final say um, right from the beginning of the project too, on how data will be shared and with who is, is, is so important too. So there's a nuance to open science, of course, um, and particularly when you're thinking about um, different certain communities that you might be working with. Yeah, and I think that um, the open science recommendation is asking for developments of infrastructures. And I think that's data infrastructures um, as well as policy infrastructures and the, the two things need to be linked and they need to have the, the sophistication, if you like, to be able um, to nuance the, um, the data sharing aspects of it. And we need to, do, we need to under, you know, we need to grow together in that to understand what, what we should be doing, what, what's the right way to do things. So I think that's a journey that we've all got to move along. Yeah, I think there's a really interesting concept, which is that quite a lot of the things that, you know, perhaps we're beginning to think about in, I'll say, more traditional science is that, you know, there are some very complex areas such as how you share data appropriately that are actually already being thought about by people that are doing citizen science appropriate for their context. So there's a huge amount that we can learn. It's not just, it's definitely not one way traffic, I think. Um, Okay, so I'll ask a couple of other questions. So one from Jackie Wilson-Stone, which is that, um, so are you finding there are projects doing open citizen science, but the projects are not branded this way? That's an interesting thought. P do people... <laughs> Should I go, Libby, and then... Yes. Yeah. So I think that's a really interesting question. I think there are, with as with, with anything, you know, when there's a terminology, people have different, uh, different ways of describing um, similar things. Um, there are some um, very useful principles, the 10 principles of citizen science that have been um, uh, introduced by EXA and there's a, an Australian version of these on the AXA website that we can share a link to that sort of describe um, well, the, ten, the principles um, that citizen science projects should aim to, you know, to, to adhere to. And um, there are sometimes projects that are a little bit more in the outreach realm um, and some that are a little bit more in the research realm and and one of the challenges here is to try and make sure that the the science that's being done is I mean it's a problem for all science not just citizen science but that it's reproducible um, that it is a sufficient quality that it can answer some scientific question that it has controls that it has some longevity that it has um, is in the form of the data is usable. But similarly, 
there has to be really great engagement in the project too. Um, people are doing this most of the time um, as volunteers. And um, if you know, you've got to make sure that the data is usable, but um, you've got to also, I think, be deeply respectful of people's time and try and make things enjoyable too. So I think there are projects that don't that that are citizen science or would be could be classified by many citizen science that aren't describing themselves in that way. Um, and I don't see any problem there. And um, there's also a lot of discussion about um, whether citizen science is the most inclusive um, way of describing this kind of um, public participation in research. But at the moment, it's uh, a helpful term um, to communicate with folks around the world who are sort of like minded and, and working in these areas. Yeah, I think it's a very broad church. I, I'm, I'm afraid I won't waste my time talking about semantics and citizen science. Um, community participation, participatory science, whatever you want to call it. That's that's the whole of the inclusive nature of what we do is, 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 is all of those things. And in fact, in the health domain, maybe I'll just speak to this. I, I, I'm the co-chair with Professor Yun Hee Jeon of the um, Charles Perkins Centre Citizen Science Node, which is um, the Charles Perkins Centre at the University of Sydney is uh, largely based on health research. And it's been fantastic to get to know colleagues who are working, for example, Professor Yun Hee Jeon is working in dementia, people who've been working in participatory research methods, which are so important, particularly with patients um, as collaborators in the research rather than as participants in research projects. Um, and I think that's one of the great things about working in this space. Um, you're constantly sort of excited and inspired by the ways uh, people are applying this type of methodology and how um, it seems to be very powerful in terms of you know, returning autonomy um, to people, particularly people who are uh, living with a desire, disease, for example, or living through an experience. Yeah, that's. I think that's. I think that's a fantastic point. And as you say, it can be very empowering for people that are participants, but be more than participants. Um, we're almost at the end, but there's one question I just wanted to uh, ask, which sort of follows up on uh, something that Kim had posted, which is that um, this concept of um, citizen science around native about wildlife, particularly native birds. And I wondered if you could comment on how um, it helps people uh, perhaps get engaged with conservation about, you know, make them actually want to uh, do more to support you know think about climate change and such like what's the importance of citizen science in in getting people more engaged and thinking about um you know sustainability and such like well i think i'll probably take that, that one because the, our local project is all about that it's all about um encouraging people to to look more carefully to experience more fully uh, the nature that they they that they have around them, whether that's um, in a cityscape or in a in a, a rural area, um, and it seems to me that when people start looking, we're all natural scientists, and we all have that um, that interest in that questioning, and if we begin to talk about ecology, not just the species, um, then it's a very, very important thing that, that we, we can do to encourage people to see the links, because unless they see the links, then they're not going to think about the importance of conservation, the importance of sustainability. And I have to say that in my uh, in my years of working in citizen science, the, the biggest failure I think I've had is not being able to encourage enough scientists to work with us to work with community on a long-term project so phonology for instance when we look at how things are changing it seems to me that we haven't we haven't leveraged um place-based science nearly enough to get this understanding in the community and and to get this interest in terms of what's happening and i'd love to see more of it i'd love to see more scientists interested in working in projects which they could do um, they could get all sorts of communities to be involved in, whether it's in Australia, New Zealand or anywhere. Um, so I'm hoping that that might come out of the work that we do in the future. Great. 
Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, we're almost at the hour, so I'll draw this to a close. That was a fantastic presentation. We're absolutely thrilled that AXA is now an affiliate of Open Access Australasia. We really look forward to working with, with you and your colleagues, and um, I think it will be a really fruitful um, kind of collaboration. So thank you very much to everyone for joining cool. as well. Thank you for your questions and keep them coming on Twitter as well. And um, yeah, watch out for, for the next webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.